I believe that science is still the only way of finding answers to life's mysteries. That's why I write my books. The problem is the demand for 100% certainty. Take one of the most exciting discoveries of recent years. DNA fingerprinting, the achievement of Sir Alec Jeffries. Like so many scientific breakthroughs, it was at once both marvellous and misunderstood. DNA fingerprinting arose in this laboratory by complete accident. I mean, I had no views back in the early 80s or even thoughts about forensic DNA typing. I mean, it was, it was crazy science fiction. At the time, Professor Jeffries was trying to study variation in human DNA to provide better markers to help scientists study inherited illness and cancer. He developed a technique that used radioactivity to highlight variable regions in the DNA. He knew it would show different patterns for different people, but he was unprepared for just how different those patterns would be. I think it was one morning, Monday morning, in September 1984, and it was a moment of total eureka. I was in the dark room, I pulled this bit of x-ray film out of the, the uh, developing tank and I could see all these uh, radioactive bands on the x-ray film, you could see all this variation between people. Suddenly I realised that here was a technology where the application was completely different from what it had been developed for, which was medical genetics. At that point I started getting really excited. These patterns were so variable that it was obvious you could use it for identity testing, we had a family group on the film, so we could see the family relationship testing. We had some non-human species on the film, and the system worked with those, so we could immediately see things like animal biology, dog paternity testing, which is carried out, believe it or not, conservation biology. So it was a wonderful moment where my, my life suddenly changed direction completely in the space of about five minutes. It was just, it was, you know, like, like a dog with far too many tails, you know, running around the laboratory and getting... Yeah, it's very juvenile, very excited. It was, it was great fun. I have to say, the first DNA fingerprint was truly awful. I mean, you, you wouldn't hang a dog based on that evidence. But I'm, I'm an optimist in science, and I could see the potential. And indeed, within a few months, we'd refine the technology to produce yeah, really quite good and, uh, and reliable uh, DNA fingerprints. They were soon in use in the courts to establish identity. But the way they were used points up how easy it is to misunderstand science. Some lawyers leapt on the new technology as foolproof and accepted DNA evidence without question, a dangerous thing to do with any evidence, while others just plain mistrusted it and sought to undermine it. Untrained in science, the legal profession lurched from one extreme to the other. Lawyers are somehow under the impression that scientists can deliver absolute certainty and say, yes, we are 100% sure. That, 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 for example, this biological evidence came from this defendant. I mean, that is naive. Science does not work like that. Science never, ever generates absolute proof. That should ring a bell. Scientific certainty is just what the politicians demanded in the mad cow crisis, and we've seen where that has led to. But does it matter if lawyers are naive about science? Well, I'm on my way to see a man who's got an answer to that question. Institutional ignorance of science turned his life upside down. When I realised what a life sentence meant was when I got to Wakefield, which was about a week and a half after conviction. And I was calling to the probation officers. Do you understand what a life sentence is, she says to me. I says, no. She said, well, you are now under the sentence of 99 years. And I shit myself. In 1990, Kevin Callan was a lorry driver and living with his girlfriend, Leslie, and her four-year-old daughter, Mandy, who had cerebral palsy. In November, Mandy became ill after a series of falls and died, apparently of a brain injury. In the midst of his grief, Kevin became caught up in a nightmare. He was accused of shaking Mandy to death. A knock's come on the door, and I, know, I now know him to be a DCI. He says, can I have a word with you in the kitchen? And I've gone in the kitchen with him and his partner, and he says, I'm arresting you on suspicion of murder. And by this time, I was stood with my back against the units in the kitchen. I literally slithered down them. I thought, oh, the blood just 
government. The prosecution case rested on the diagnosis of Mandy's injuries. Brain injuries are the specialty of neuropathology, but the prosecution only called on a paediatrician and a pathologist to testify. Their evidence pointed the finger at Kevin. The defence chose to rebut this by relying on two similar experts. And then I asked my junior barrister where my experts were when it came time for the defence. And he just turned around and told me to shut up. So then, the end of the... Your own barrister you know, yeah. shut up? Yeah. The end of the prosecution case came. It was our turn, and they called me to the stand. Which meant I was the only one from the defence to give evidence. No experts, nobody else but myself. Kevin's experts weren't called because their diagnosis agreed with the prosecution. He was convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment. Kevin set about proving that the law had got it wrong. He was not an educated man, but he began to teach himself neuropathology. He spent months making detailed notes from textbooks. Then he found a book called Head Injuries, The Facts, written by Philip Wrightson, a New Zealand neuropathologist. From that, when I read it, I read it again and again, upside down, back to front. Any which way you could have read that book, I read it, because in there was what happened to Mandy. Judges. Kevin sent Professor Wrightson the details of the case, including the autopsy notes. This good doctor wrote back at once, demolishing the prosecution's scientific evidence. It was quite heavy in, in a condemnation of the evidence. Unjustifiable was one word. Of course, this is not so. Impossible to justify was another one. And they go on and on and on. Wrightson confirmed Kevin's story. For him, the evidence showed that Mandy had died from the fall, not from being shaken. Kevin was released and has since married Mandy's mother, Leslie. But an innocent man spent four years in jail because all the lawyers involved in his case did not realize a brain injury needs a brain expert until a new team took up his appeal. Nobody, absolutely nobody, had understood the particular expertise that was required in this case. The original solicitor, the original barristers on both sides did not appreciate this. The judge at the trial did not appreciate it. They're the ones who, as a defendant, or should I say ex-defendant, who you place your whole, it, well, yeah, literally your whole life in. And if they don't know what they're talking about, your case cannot therefore be presented in the proper way. There must be a very substantial number of people sitting in prison now who are sitting there because forensic science has played a major contribution in their conviction. And, furthermore, that, that forensic science may have been flawed. I suspect that if lawyers were more familiar with science, there'd be fewer miscarriages of justice. It's just another powerful argument for society to take science more seriously. There are so many reasons for making science a part of our lives, and I don't want to dwell on the negative ones. So let's get out of the courtroom and into something more rewarding. Join me after the break. <laughs>